This is a quote that um, is from James Joyce. It's one of my favorite quotes, and as I turned 75 years old, it has particular poignancy as I look back on a career. But it says, every life is many days, day after day. We walk through ourselves, meeting robbers, ghosts, giants, old men, young men, wives, but always meeting ourselves. Keep that in mind as I just share these next nine or 10 minutes with you. But um, when I was finishing residency back in 1985, I was planning to be an oncologist. I got waylaid to take a job uh, with the new Boston Healthcare for the Homeless program. It was just starting up. Um, and I agreed to do it for a year, um, thinking that it would be my year of giving back. I graduated from college in the 60s, you know, and it was giving back. Um, and so I knew nothing about homelessness, um, but I just finished training at MGH. My last job was to be the senior re medical resident running the ICU. And I figured, how tough can it be after you run the ICU to run a shelter clinic? So I went down to um, Pine Street Inn. On the, it was the day after I finished residency, and I had never been there before. For those of you who are not from Boston, it's a seven, at the time there were 700 people staying at Pine Street Inn. It's an amazing institution, um, but it's chaotic. And um, it's the oldest and largest shelter in New England. And I walked in thinking, um, you know, they're gonna be glad they have a doctor finally. And there's a great nurses clinic there that was in the back of the main lobby. And I got there and all these nurses were there and I was expecting to be greeted warmly. In fact, they sat me down. I have an older sister who's a nurse, by the way, and I know the stern look of nurses, if any of you are out here. Um, they sat me down and explained that we as doctors had really been trained all wrong and we had not done a very good job taking care of homeless people. So if I really wanted to learn how to do this, I had to um, soak feet for two months. It was my apprenticeship. They took away my stethoscope, all, my, all the stuff I depended on as a doctor, and I started soaking feet. And the nurses did this brilliant thing of inviting people in each night. They just call them by their name, Mr. Williams, and I would watch people light up when someone said their name tenderly, because it was almost never done. And then this um, remarkable thing they do, which is really comforting, it's obviously got a biblical symbolism to it, but it's truly comforting and it puts me as a provider at the foot of the person you're serving, a long way from their personal space. And I was used to being just a stethoscope away from people's most intimate personal spaces. Um, and it, our other mandate was we had to just listen. Just don't ask questions, don't you know, push them on whether you're hearing voices or whether you've got chest pain. Just say, how can I help? And it was the brilliance of the nurses that taught us this very first principle, that it's all about taking time, being present, um, and listening to people, going to wherever they are, and never, ever judging. That was the brilliance of the nurses. They never judged anybody. Um, and then the second principle we learned was from these folks. And this is a, a much later picture of the original group of homeless people that got together with Mayor Flynn and decided how they wanted to be served on, in the model of this program. So we had nothing to do with this. It was the homeless people. And what their main concern, well, I could talk forever about this, but their main concern was that their lives were full of fragmentation and loss, and that the last thing they wanted in their health care was more fragmentation. So they had a document that they got Hale and Dorr to, to draft. It was signed by the mayor and the chiefs of medicine at the two hospitals, Mass General and Boston Medical Center, which is Boston City then, that said, um, we will be about social justice and not charity. And I, you know, I was coming out of residency. Social justice was a long way from anything I had thought about. But by that, they meant they, didn't want, they just didn't want charity. And they thought volunteers, and I had gotten lots of people to help volunteer in this, they thought that smacked of charity. And so from their eyes, it was more charity, and they didn't want it. And so these folks, um, you know, if you fast forward, our program has now grown to, you know, we have probably 30 full-time doctors and 40 nurse practitioners and PAs. We do the clinics in most of the adult shelters in Boston. We have a great respite program um, and a street program that goes out. And we've done a lot of research, but we still have homeless people sort of designing and implementing our, our programs. And they are on our board of directors. We have five of them on our board of, four to five on their board of direct, on our board of directors. So they still, you know, that principle of involving the people you're serving in the care was something I had never learned in the hospital and they taught us. Now what I'd love to do is say use those two principles. I'm gonna show you, you know, how consistency, continuity of care, and sort of being there over time kind of really can nourish a career. And I think for most of our clinicians in our program and anyone working in our program, it's that devotion to mission over time that really matters. This is Michael, and I'll just give you two quick stories. Michael, I met um, in 1985. He was on the streets of Boston. Some of you may recognize him. He was a real character. 
Um, he, I would see him on the Pine Street van, which goes out every night from nine at night till five in the morning. They bring soup and sandwiches and blankets to people that are outside. And I got to ride on that several nights a week for many, many years. And it's how I got to know most people in the street. But Michael, during the daytime, some of you may know him, he would sit at most, uh, in the last part of his life, he would sit at the corner of Beacon and Charles Street where there's a Starbucks. And he had insane street smarts even though he could not read or write. He had grown up in the South, come had in a very abusive situation, come up to Boston hoping to get a better life, but ended up on the streets when he was 14 and never learned to read or write and was out there. But Michael knew everybody's name coming into Starbucks. He'd open the door for you. He'd remember your kids' names. He was just great. And um, many, I'm sure most of the regulars, if any of you are at that Starbucks, would know Michael well. But frame shifted about 15 years now, and Michael is sort of, he's, we sort of got to know him, and he shared stuff with us, and we really got to engage him in healthcare. And he comes in one day, and he's got nodes on his clavicle, lymph nodes over his clavicle, and that was his, the presentation of his prostate cancer. And we brought him upstairs to this, the cancer suite at MGH, which was great with them. It was a whole cancer team. They got, started him on radiation, and while he was going through radiation, we would bring him over to our McGinnis house, which is this place which I love, where people who are sick, think about this, when you're sick or going through something awful, but you live on the streets, you live in the shelters, we can take care of you. Um, and these are some of our nurses, and Julie, who's here with me now with Michael. And you can see he's smiling because he's got a bed, three meals, and really a devoted team taking care of him. It's really great. And as a, because we had him there, he actually went into remission with this, um, initial remission with this, and we were able to get him a place to live. So with a lot of help from many people around town, he signed a lease for his first ever apartment. He's 58 years old, finally has an apartment, and you can see the broad smile. Then he goes to the shelter and he gets a cat, and he wants a cat because all his life he's dreaming of having his own cat. Um, he used to see stray cats out in the street, and he, that's him in his apartment just delighted. So um, everything is good, except I realized, we realized, that street smarts don't translate into smarts of taking care of your own small apartment. So it was a lot of visiting him at home and helping out with that. But about four years, frame shift now four years, um, and his cancer recurs. And this time, very aggressively, it's all over his body. So um, he... Um, uh, we brought him into, this is Becky, who's a nurse on our team, and would pick him up on Friday mornings, bring him to Mass General, where he'd go into the chemotherapy suite. The thing I remember most about going to visit him there is you, I went in to see him. He's in the chemo suite, you know, which is always kind of grim, as many of you may know. And he's sitting there. He's obviously on palliative care, not even curative care. But as I walk in, you know, he's got tubes coming all over the place, but he's watching a flat screen TV, he's eating his, the lunch that they got for him, and there are two nurses helping him out, and he smiles at me and he goes, Doc, it just doesn't get any better than this. <laughs> um, no one's ever said that to me on chemotherapy before. But in fact, you know, in his life, things did not get much better. But anyway, he, um, frame shift more now, he's really sick. It's going, the cancer is going through all of his bones. He's in exquisite pain, but he won't leave his apartment because of his cat. So our, nurse, our physician assistant on our team, whose name is Jen Nunes, who's really remarkable, said to Michael, I'll take the cat home and take care of the cat so that he could come to the hospital and we could do end of life and, and uh, hospice care. So Michael agreed to go to the hospital. At this point, he's only got maybe a week to live or maybe a couple weeks, but he's in exquisite pain. So he goes to the hospital, and um, about four days before he died, he calls me up as I was on my way to do rounds. And he calls up and he says, Doc, can you give me one last Big Mac? He said, but remember, no lettuce. Cannot have any lettuce. Um, of course, you know, that's not easy to do, by the way, if anybody tries to go to McDonald's. But so I went into his room, and it literally, this is four days before he's dying. He's, it looks like he's in extremis. And I, I gently went in there. I said, Michael, you sure? I've got your Big Mac. You sure you want it? And he sits up. And he smiles like this. And he just gnaws at this Big Mac like it's the most magnificent thing in the world. What he was showing us was this remarkable resilience that he's had all his life, that he could smile about what's going on in front of him and ignore the unbelievable tragedy of his life, what he had done. Anyway, he died about four days after this. His funeral was held by some people on Beacon Hill at one of the churches at the top, and there were about 80 people that showed up for his funeral, all of whom had gotten to know him over the time. And I kind of wish he would know what, what sparkle he brought to so many of our lives. 
One more story. This is Susie from a completely different background. Um, she came up from Florida in probably about 2003 or 2004 with a boyfriend living on the street. She used to sell, many of you know, spare change. She sold it down in what was then Borders Park. Um, and she was a magic. She could talk to anybody, talk to anybody going by. She was just great. Um, and then she had lots of problems. She had heart failure, atrial fibrillation. She had terrible peripheral neuropathy. And I could go on and on. And she would come to our clinic at MGH when she really needed care. And we could keep her connected to several specialists. Specialist. She had four specialists at the hospital. Um, and she, when she came in, as you can see, she's with Walter, and this is our team. She would just brighten everything up. The students loved her. She would teach them. She would do everything. So she was kind of fun to have. Um, and if, after a long time on the street, now I'm telescoping time here, but many years, she gets an apartment with Walter. She pays for it herself. With he, she and Walter put their money together, put all of their money into paying for rent. And this was an apartment. It was in Revere. And I kind of took that picture because you can see the beach in the background there. But what was most fascinating about this, when she got to her apartment, she was able to get her stuff out of storage. She had these things in storage. And she pulls out of her storage this picture. And um, I looked at it like, you know, what's this, Susie? And she says, well, that's me. That's me when I was the lead singer in a, in a band in Asbury Park, New Jersey. And she used to open for Sha Na Na. Um, for those of you who are not um, baby boomers, you wouldn't even know who that is. But, um, and she was very proud of it. And then she went over to her thing and she pulled out the sequin dress that she used to wear when she was singing in nightclubs. She was very proud that she could still fit into it. Um, but the reason she could still fit into it is because she so, lost so much weight now with her end stage illness that she's just months away from dying at this point. Um, but Susie went on to um, die about, I would say, four months after that. And her family came up for the funeral. Um, funerals, by the way, are a big deal for us. How do you celebrate or you know, mark the passing of someone that was really important in your lives, but you're not always sure who their network or family is. But they came up and her family was all like, they played for the New York Philharmonic, the San Francisco Philharmonic. She came from this distinguished, really amazing family. And just before she died, we had gotten in the mail this request from a guy who was writing a book about uh, the, uh, the music scene on the New Jersey boardwalk, Asbury Park and places like that. And he had this, this um, an old video of Susie singing. And he wanted to know where she was and how she was doing. And um, this is that video. I will um, just say that, listen to this, because it sort of tells you sort of the beauty behind some of the things that when you're walking by people outside, Knowing their stories or learning their stories often takes years and sometimes decades, but they always have a story that points out, one, the struggles they've had and the things they've tried to overcome, but mostly it's their resilience and their courage. So it turns from looking, make, walking by someone and thinking, God, what are they doing, to realizing that these are people that live with incredible courage. And I would only end by saying the other thing we've learned that following the, in our program, we get a chance to follow these folks over decades. You know, some of the people I've been caring for now for 39 years. And there's something about the privilege of being invited into their lives, um, being able to stand with them, whether it's darkness or light. Even though we can't end homelessness, we're only doctors and nurses. We can take care of people and try to limit suffering, but we can't do that. But let me leave you with, just listen to, this is what um, Susie sang. So thank you very much, and it's been such a privilege to be here among all of you, so thanks, Sam. Thank you.